Can everyone hear me okay? Am I loud enough this morning? Do you want, do you want me to use the other mic or everyone can hear? Excellent. All right, using WordPress API. For some people, I hope this doesn't go over your head. I'm trying to make sure that I'm speaking to everybody in a way that you can understand the real benefit of using the WordPress API to sync an app. Now, a little bit about who I am. Um, I have a website, Divi Framework. I've been making some plugins and stuff. It's kind of in beta. It's not really ready yet, but take a look at it. Follow us on Twitter. I have MRK websites or MRK development, any of those around you know, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff, that's where you'll find me. Um, in this shot, I was actually shooting a screencast tutorial in the rainforest, because um, why not? So the great thing is, is with the internet and stuff, you can work anywhere, and WordPress gives us so much freedom. It gives us the freedom to do a lot of different things. So what do I do? Well, I do training. Me and my wife have actually been traveling around Australia in a Winnebago, being paid to train a large Australian corporation's offices. It's pretty cool. And we still run our business by using WordPress, the internet, and our wonderful MacBooks. So by doing all of that, we have really found that we love doing training. I also make websites, of course, WordPress, all that kind of stuff. Love my Ionic stuff, Angular, you know, all those different things. I really love geeking out on all that kind of thing. And particularly, I've been enjoying VR stuff lately, VR video, VR photos, you know, and incorporating that into the web. It's all pretty interesting stuff. So why do we use WordPress? Well, because it's free. But it's not just because it's free, it's because it gives us freedom to build so many different things. You think about it, where would we all be without WordPress? You know? You would have had to have paid for some proprietary code, you would have had to spend a lot of money, you might have had to develop something on your own for a long time, but the wonderful thing that we have with WordPress is it's free and we all contribute to this stuff all the time. And it's fantastic. There's also lots of users and lots of developers, which means that most of the time, if you can't fix something, somebody else has already fixed it. And I love that uh, Simpsons episode where Homer is at the bar, he's talking to Mo and he says, can't someone else do it? And I'm like, that's your term. That's what you should say. That's your pitch to run for, for office. And he, everyone starts marching around and can't someone else do it? And the great thing with WordPress is most of the time when you guys go to do something, someone else has already done it. And that's awesome. I love that because ultimately we're a little bit lazy sometimes. So where are we going? Me and Kate, well, we're just continuing to travel around and enjoy ourselves and uh, continue to make great things. But as of today, where are we going? Well, we're gonna be talking about the REST API, particularly in WordPress. So what is the REST API? It's a way to get data out of your WordPress site in an easy to consume way for a lot of apps. So normally, all your data is in a web page, isn't it? And it's nice and well displayed for us to look at it. But with the REST API, computers don't really wanna pull in your nicely styled HTML and try and pass it and turn it into something for an app. They want to be able to get the data in nice little controlling structures so that they understand what it is so they can do something with it. Okay, so you can get like a list of users, you can get a list of blog posts, you can get all your different posts actually in a very simple list in an easy way for your application to deal with it. That's basically what the REST API allows us to do. So when do you use and should you consider making a native app? See. Everyone got really excited in the early days about apps, didn't they? And every business just was like, I've got to be in the store and get an app. And there was apps for a dentist. There was apps for the hairdresser. There was apps for all sorts of businesses that really weren't appropriate for apps. So when should you consider building an app? Well, first of all, how often does anybody here install a new app on your phone and actually use it regularly, adopt the usage? It doesn't happen very often, does it? We'll adopt websites a lot though. So if you're trying to reach a new audience, an app is probably not the way to do it because you have to get them to install the app. So you still need a great website, you still need web content, and unless you're gonna do something that's actually stepping up above the content and, and that functionality of a website, why would you need to make an app? You don't. So the way I like to think about it is there's really two use cases of when you need to make an app. The first is when you have a community of people 
and you want to get something in the way of that regular relationship. A regular relationship is something like a school and that's the one I'm showing you today. You see those parents have a daily relationship, don't they, with the school. They're dropping their kids off all the time and quite often there's communication issues because we all know that kids quite often don't deliver the notes home to mum and dad, <laughs> right? And there's, you can't trust a five-year-old to be your communication channel as a private school when that private school might be charging thousands of dollars a term, <coughs> a term to be able to, you know, teach that student. So it's really important in this case to have the app to help assist with that communication, okay? Really good use case of an app. Another good use case is when you can't actually deliver what you want to deliver properly on the web. So another one I'm going to talk a little bit about today is a VR app that we're starting to develop. Now we can't deliver the 4K VR video over the web API because it keeps dropping frames and a lot of things just can't handle it. But if you happen to know what an Oculus is or a HTC Vive VR headset, they're excellent at dealing with this high level video. So we're using the WordPress API to deliver that to a desktop app in this case. So we can deliver the very high quality video to those devices that can make the most of it. And these videos are kind of around 250 to 500 megabyte, uh, 250 to 500 megabytes yeah, a minute. All right, so you have a four minute video, you've got two gigs. It's a big video. <laughs> Even my MacBook Pro can't play it. So that's, a, that's a, a good advantage there. So the advantage of the local installation is I can use local stuff. I can use those local features, okay? Really good use case of the REST API with apps. There's also some bad things as well. It's not all rainbows and twizzlers. It's, there's issues, isn't there? What are the issues? Well, first of all, I've got to manage an app. I've got to deal with the app store. I've got to deal with app updates. I've got to deal with platform updates. I've got to deal with debugging and testing. And when that comes to Android, that's pretty hard. There's a lot of different Android devices out there. It's getting easier, but there's some disadvantages in that case because managing apps is not easy. Okay, it's another bunch of skills that you have to add in there. There's another bunch of expenses that you add into your build. So, you know, you have to really consider strongly if you want to go down this path. Okay, you've got to really take a strong consideration before you pick an app. But if you've got a real reason to get in that relationship, if you've got a real reason to deliver that content, then I think it's well worth considering the REST API for delivering that information. So our first case study today is the Parks Christian School. Now the Parks Christian School We've been making their website for years and they wanted to get an app for one very simple reason. Where I am in parks, it doesn't take long out of town before you get very patchy internet. And what we we're finding is they were emailing out this giant printable PDF to everybody as their newsletter. And that didn't really work real good because it took ages for the parents to download it. And that means they weren't reading it because they just simply couldn't download it. It just took too long because it got patchy internet. So we started doing HTML emails, but then a lot of these parents weren't actually reading their email very often. They'd just go into it once a week because they have to load up the internet and it was painful for them to do so. So we created an app and the app sits on the phones and synchronizes down. It gives us the ability to deliver this content to those parents and synchronize it, okay? This means that we can send the instant notifications, we can do calendar integration and things like that, and that's all inside this app. So when we add an event to the CMS in WordPress, it's instantly added to the app. Inside the app, I can then add it to my calendar with a native button, so that if it's important for myself, because my student's involved in that particular event, it's just a simple click of the button and it's added in. That's pretty cool. The great thing is though is it also caches. So every single time we pull that data down and they're at McDonald's having a coffee, they're on the free Wi-Fi and they get it, it stays in the app, okay? That means when they're out on the farm, they're in an area where the internet's slow, it doesn't matter anymore, they've got the cache data held inside the app and I'll show you that code shortly. To build it, we used Ionic version two. At the time it was beta, but I liked it, so we used it anyway and we just fixed the bugs as we found them and submitted patch things. Now there's nothing wrong with using beta software if you test it for your use case, right? And it's open source, so if you guys find bugs in beta code, well it's a good idea to tell someone about it and submit a patch. 
So that's what we did. It's got fantastic scaffolding tools and it's very simple, Ionix version 2. What I really liked about it is sometimes when you build things, you end up with what we call spaghetti code. You got stuff all over the place and very quickly it gets a little bit out of hand and you're a bit like, what happens if I pull this and before you know it, a meatball falls off that way? You know, ooh, I better not pull that, I'll pull this thing and nothing happens at all, you know? And you realize there was no dependency on that thing at all, you don't even know why it's there. But you end up with some real messy code, but Ionic version 2 gives us some real neat setups. And it has these scaffolding tools as well, so that you can really just say, hey, create me a new page with a controller and that kind of stuff, almost like how we make post types, I guess, in WordPress with the CLI tools. You know, you make a new post type and what happens in the WordPress backend? You get a new menu, don't you? You get the read and update areas, you get categories and things like that. So this is very similar as what we're doing here in Ionic and we map them up. So we pull the data in. Can we read that? Is it a bit too small or? All right. But basically, this code kind of does everything. And uh, we just, we, we construct a URL here to get to the data. So let's take a look at this a little bit more carefully. Which button's the, it's that one, is it? There we go, right. So we've got the host. So this is just coded in our app because we were using proxies when we developed it. But that's just the Parks Christian School. WPJSON is what we, the data that we want. And we want all the posts of a type and a page number. So this one here will give us, if I put post in there, post type post, or post type page, or post type event, you get a different type of item, don't you? So if I want all my events, just shove event in this post type in your constructing class, or this page is just page one. Give me the first page of my events, and I'll get my data out. Um, and basically this is our local storage. So here, what I've done, is I'm getting a couple of different bits and pieces of code. If you guys want me to do more code as well, I can show you the actual project. Do you want me to do that or who wants to look? All right, there's a few. Okay, we'll open that up. All right, so we've got basically a mapping here, some HTTP, we grab the local storage and bang. I just load it, we get the post type, get all the data and we load it. Looks pretty simple to me. Um, I hope you guys kind of find it simple. All right. Okay. So this is what I was talking about. See how we've got our pages here on the left-hand side? So just here. These are all my pages inside the app. So I've got events, FAQ, news, etc. So if we open up the news and look at the HTML here, we can see this is using something that kind of looks a little bit like short codes, doesn't it? Can I zoom that? I don't normally have to zoom my code, so. So that's kind of like the template, right? Yeah, that's right. So here what we're doing is we're taking our content, I've got a refresher button here to refresh it. I've got a card. And for all the items that I get out of that request that I showed you earlier, I just loop through them. And this just maps up. So it's very similar to looping over posts, isn't it? And you can see that all this is really nice because these are all components. They're a bit like short codes. When you have a short code, everyone here know what a short code is? So sh the short codes, yep. So you put parameters in a short code, don't you, when you get a much more complex thing than the code you had to write. It's shorthand, and this is very similar, but these are called directives in Angular, and this is what we did to create these items. And then we have an infinite scroll component at the bottom here, and that does all our scrolling for us. So that's pretty much it. Now, this got created almost for us. We've got some SCSSC. That's complicated. <laughs> Didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to style anything. It just kind of does it. And this is what we call TypeScript. Um, TypeScript is a way of writing our JavaScript that gives us types, okay? So normally one of the problems with JavaScript is if I send in an object and it's a number and I do the wrong thing with it, all of a sudden it turns into a string and I do one plus one and it equals 11 instead of two, all right? Because you didn't have a type. You didn't say this is always a number or this is always a string. 
Now in some cases you do want 1 plus 1 to equal 11, in other cases you want it to equal 2. And in that case what you do is you define how that operates by giving it a type. Okay? So here what we've done, um, we've imported our Angular core component, I've got my controller. The provider is what actually provides the data. I've got my date display pipe, and that's a tool that we're using to format the dates. Okay, so a pipe is kind of like, hey, I want to put one thing in one end and get it out the other formatted. So you throw it through a pipe. They call it in Ionic. I've got my data in the page, and then of course I've got my Google Analytics item to track the analytics. And all I really do then is just grab my component, get the template URL, tell it the provider, tell it the pipe, and it kind of just all works like magic, really. It's really cool. <laughs> it actually didn't take as long to build this app. It took us about three days from start to finish to build the whole app. I mean, that's cool. And it's very easy to find something. So it's like, oh, I've got a problem with my news provider. We'll just open it. There it is right there. That's it. That does all the magic of dealing with the REST API for me. It's just that. I mean, that's just so easy. It's amazing. So really all we do is just pull in a couple of components, grab the path to the REST API and all the data that's given to me. Pretty simple. For a lot of guys, you're probably looking at this code going, yeah, that looks simple, but I don't know how to write that. Well, um, I'll put a post up on my website and give you guys the code if you want. Just take a look at it. I mean, it's, it's not that much rocket science. Ionic is very simple to use. And uh, yeah, we've, we've found it to be great for us. Um, it saved us so much time. So were there any real challenges with this app? There were, of course. The big one was that we were in a beta setup at the time. Ionic version 2 is now stable, so all those problems that we had are gone. It was really just finding out how to do things because it was very early on in the development of Ionic version 2. It just meant that, you know, it took us a while to find some documentation. And out of the three days of development, we probably spent one day researching just trying to find stuff that other people had written. And I'm terrible at writing blog posts and things like that and putting stuff out there. I need to do more of it to share this kind of stuff. Because once we share it, all of a sudden, it becomes so much more valuable to everybody. This app had a certain amount of value, but if I share it to you guys, it actually becomes more valuable because people can use that information, can't they? It goes beyond just those people at the Parks Christian School using it. So where do I want to go with it in the future? Um, at the moment, we don't have an automatic instant notification. I'd love it if when you post something to the news on WordPress that you could put a flag on it and say, send an instant notification about this. It's important. We don't currently have that. So we have to go into another app to send the instant notifications. It's a bit of a pain. And I'd like to fix that. The other thing I want to do is add um, some classifications from the API to notifications. So for example, you could say, all right, I've got a kid in kindergarten and I've got a kid in year six, send me the notifications for those class years. All right, so you just say I'm, I've got an enrollment year of this and an enrollment year of that. There we go. That's the student right there um, that needs to get those notifications so that you can send something to the parents to say, reminder, there's a special assembly on for the year six kids this morning at 10.30 and they're all gonna sing something and do something cute. Um, and then the parents don't miss it, right? Um, the engagement stats need to be improved a little bit. We're just doing some simple stuff, like you saw that simple little controller I did with Google Analytics, just checking the views. But I'd like to actually know what people are pressing and just a few more event hooks, you know, like are people actually adding stuff to their calendar or not? We don't really know, because <laughs> we're not tracking it. So I'd like to add those things in. The other thing I'd like to do is make a login for the teachers to be able to send instant notifications to those groups. So Mr. Westcott comes along, logs in, and can send a notification to all the primary school kids' parents. Just bang, you know? That'd be great. But the way it stands right now, you can't do that. And out of all of that, it'll ultimately drive more engagement with the app. So the next one I want to talk about is Farm VR. You can take a look at this website. We've integrated some nice VR stuff in there. It's still a work in progress. We expect this to be launched in about four weeks' time. Tim, um, I took that photo for him. That's near the dish in Parks. If anyone knows where Parks is, we've got a big satellite dish there. And this is just on the road in a sorghum paddock there. We took this photo about four, five, six weeks ago, something like that. 
So why do we need an app for high-res VR content? So we're going to be making a desktop app in this case and pulling the data in. We're going to be using Ionic again. Everything I showed you before, we're just going to take that stuff, throw it in there and get the data out. But what we do with that data is going to be different. So we've created a custom post type in the website. And this post type allows us to have different resolution videos. All right, so I can set up four videos for one video that I'm actually going to deliver. One will be the 4K full high res VR video that when you put it on the HTC Vive, honestly, like it's like you're actually there. It's amazing. We've shot some stuff and you put the headset on it, it just, it's just phenomenal. <laughs> like you literally feel like you're there. I did one where I walked out on the cliffs off Phillip Island up onto the, with the, the sea, all the waves coming in and, you know, birds flying overhead and, oh gee, it's amazing. It, it was just absolutely amazing stuff. It blew my mind. Got me really excited about the VR stuff. So we're going to pull those high-res videos into the desktop only. If you're on the website, you'll be able to download it, but there's no point as even trying to play it because even on my MacBook Pro here with a two gigabyte graphics card, it drops frames. It can't handle it. It's too much. If I actually watch these videos on my Samsung Gear and the Oculus headset, I can watch it for about 10 minutes, then I've got to put it in the fridge to cool it down. <laughs> Literally, I actually put the phone in the fridge. Right? It's not an exaggeration, that's what I do, because you have to cool it down. So you've got to put it in the fridge for about 10 minutes, watch for 10 minutes, put it back in the fridge for 10 minutes to manage the temperature of the thing. Right? It's, it's full on video, it's great fun though. Right? So we're going to do these Vive apps and then possible mobile apps in the future for the Samsung um, VR store. So we're going to use the Electron Desktop Toolkit for this. Um, has anybody here used the Atom Editor? Yep. That's Electron. Anyone here use Slack? Yep, that's Electron, right? So Electron is a way that we can use HTML to make desktop apps. Pretty awesome stuff, right? I think it's amazing. So we're going to be using that and use the same Ionic stuff, the same everything, suck it all in, bang, we've got a desktop app for Vive. All those videos will download in a queue, suck out of the Amazon cloud and download onto your device. And then you can experience these great videos that otherwise we can't deliver on the web right now. So we can't actually deliver this content on the web. It's not possible. You just can't handle it. The thing just, just, it just, you know, unless you want to cook eggs on your laptop, there's no real point in trying to do this. <laughs> but it works great if you've got a Vive and a liquid cooled desktop with all that stuff. It really does. So we're going to pull the data in, then we store it locally. But in this case, we're not really talking about storing HTML data or JSON data, we're talking about storing the actual large downloaded files. So it's really just going to be a download manager, right? It's not like you're going to go into this app and actually experience all the farming stuff. It'll just be really download lists, you know? Um, so when will it be released? We're actually aiming for around the first week of April that we expect this to come out. So keep an eye on farmvr.com.au. You can take a look at it now and, you know, that'll be great. Now, the thing is, right now, I haven't actually told you anything that's real synchronization, have I? Because we're pulling data in, we're syncing it locally from the cloud, but we're not actually ever pushing anything up, are we? See, when you want to do that, a couple other issues come out, and I thought I'd just share those. How am I doing for time, guys? Well, 15, cool. All right, this will take about five minutes, and then we can do some questions. So first of all, um, right now, with WordPress, the authentication for a native app is not ideal. We rely a lot on cookies for authentication right now with WordPress. And as a result, if you're on page and you want to do editing and to-do apps and things like that with like Angular or Vue.js or something, you can use these JavaScript libraries to because you can log in check your cookie that you're logged in and then pull the permissions out of WordPress to be able to do things with the API. But when you're on a mobile app, where are you going to put the cookie? You don't have them, do you? You don't have like a same session state. So normally what we do is we have what we call an authentication protocol. It's an agreement, a way of operating an authentication. Now at the moment, there are some plugins for WordPress that can do this, but they're not really core tools that you can use reliably, okay? So the, the problem with this is you might end up having an authentication plugin, you might get your app going, and WordPress might update, which you want to update because there's a major security flaw, and your app will break. 
and then you've got to submit something to the App Store, and Apple is notorious for being really fast <laughs> at getting you in the App Store. No, as a matter of fact, it takes a while. Sometimes you're talking two weeks. So your app could be not working and not allowing people to log in and use it. And if you've got in the way and managed to successfully get in one of those relationships and all of a sudden your app stops working for two weeks, who here would keep an app on their phone and keep trying for two weeks to try and reuse it again? You wouldn't, would you? you just go, oh, it's broken, the rubbish, delete. And you're going to get flooded with comments in the Android or the App Store about it being a crappy application. Your application's horrible. I want to send you the bill to get the hours of my life back. <laughs> you know, things like that. Because, hey, users, sometimes we get like that. We're just impatient and we're, we, we feel horrified that this thing doesn't work. But, hey, that happens. The good news is, is REST um, and, and the API is going to be getting some OAuth 2.0. So OAuth 2.0 is the easiest way to deal with your authentication. Okay, we, that's what we want. And I found out we're going to get it, which is fantastic. So I don't know how long that is away, but once OAuth 2 becomes part of WordPress, all of a sudden this synchronization stuff's going to become possible. So let's talk about syncing data now. So WordPress, it has one powerful flaw. <laughs> it's the thing that makes it powerful that actually gives it this flaw. And that is posts. We extend post types all the time. This is what sometimes gives us problems with Divi websites because it uses posts a lot to extend and do things. It's all extending posts. You know, WooCommerce, it's the same thing, isn't it? We extend posts to all these things like variants and product types and things. And all of a sudden we have this one table in our database that's getting hit a lot to deal with just about everything in our website. So the post table is powerful. It allows us to do a lot of things, but it's also a weakness when it comes to dealing with the data. So let's think about what we're going to do here. We want to pull down some data and synchronize now. Let's say I've got a to-do list. I've got my list of items on my to-do list, and I create a to-do list on my mobile app, but I don't have connection to the internet. What ID do I give that item? I don't know what it is on the WordPress app. I've got 10,000 users creating to-do items. <laughs> How do I know what ID it is? I don't. But I've got to give it something to make it relate to that list and to be able to be usable in my app. So I'll give it a temporary ID or give it a local ID. Then I get my internet connection back and it has to synchronize that item with the cloud because now I want to be able to log in on my website to do with my to-do list because I'm at work. See, I was on the train adding to-do list items. I'm in a tunnel, <laughs> no internet. Get to work, that's got to have synchronized somehow in there and still have all the relationships that I set on my device. So what do I do? There's two ways you can do with this, but they all really deal with a lot of code. The first one is you have a local ID and a remote ID. Does that make sense? You have an ID locally. That just relates to your app on your phone, but then when it pushes it into the cloud, it gets an extra ID, which is the post ID, okay? And then you update it that way by synchronizing the two. That gets really messy when you have lots of different content. The second way to deal with it is you have a temporary ID and then when you update it, you get the ID out of the WordPress cloud, out of the REST API, give it back to you, and you update the IDs. The problem with this is if you have lots of related data, all your relationships break and you have to have special cascading queries. And the local databases in apps aren't very good at doing that. <laughs> you know, So you end up having to write all this code just trying to deal with synchronizing quite simple objects. And in my opinion, WordPress is probably not the best tool to use for this, okay? If you've got things with this two-way sync going on a lot, I wouldn't pick WordPress to build that kind of stuff. I'd pick something that's specifically made for dealing with APIs, specifically for mobile apps with libraries that help you do this. One day it might be able to do this really well, but for now I would probably be considering other tools, okay? So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you for this morning. And uh, I hope you guys learnt a little bit of something about how to do this. As I say, follow my, my website and things, and I'll put up some code links later today so you guys can get access to that code. And uh, if there's any questions, fire away. Oh, one other thing as well. The only stupid thing to do at question time is not ask a question. <laughs> so please, just ask.
Um, so questions about storage. Yes. Um, so you've got all your posts on the site that people are creating, and then you download those essentially into the app. Yes. How much storage are you actually? Does that app end up? Because obviously in the app store it'll tell you how big it is. Yep. And then the information that you're then downloading from the uh, from the website. Yep. It does. We don't go over about 10 megabytes. Yeah. Um, How many items is that? Oh, there's about 20 items in there in each area. Yeah. Because the thing is, we, we're storing JSON data. It's very light. Mm -hmm. So when we pull the REST API, what happens, that pool of data that we get, we just store it mm -hmm. as, as exactly the same file format. Mm -hmm. So then we didn't have to have any interpreters. So the thing is, if we created it and put it in a database, we would have to make a layer then to say, pull this thing from the REST API, then put it into the database, then pull it out. Whereas if instead all I do is I grab the item and every time just shove the file off to the side, then if I go out to the cloud and it times out, all I do is say instead return this local packet of data. Do you download and store images? Or is it just yes, we do. So as the image comes down, it runs through Acacia again, shoves it to a local one. That's why we had that URL as a parameter. And what we do is we change the URL to a local URL instead. We save the file as the full query string or as the file name. And this then means that as it pulls it down, we just save it in as a text cache, basically, as a local storage text cache. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, we found that to be really easy, actually. Yeah. Hey, um, how, how did you approach the, um, the like, creating the native apps? Like, it's like, I, like Ionic's got its own libraries that just links in and just outputs the... the That's exactly right. One command. Yep, you just pull the libraries in. So has anyone here used NPM libraries like Node or anything like that? Yep. Gulp, all these sorts of things. Same sort of stuff. All I do is say Ionic, publish Android. And, and I get an Android app. Like, is it, how does it compare to React Native? I haven't used React Native, unfortunately. Yep. Um, I liked Angular. I've used it for a long time. So for me, moving over to React wasn't worth the investment in this particular app usage yeah. scenario. So. It's just a matter, it's just all in built into it. You do, you do the app. Well, I would say React is not a framework as much as it is a library. Yeah. Ionic is a framework. Yeah. This means that everything you need in the framework is already there. So you don't, whereas React, you pull libraries in, right, from all over the place. Angular and Ionic are frameworks. So I don't need to go and find something to run my SCSS. I don't need to r find something to do my type scripting. I don't need to find other libraries. Everything's all built into the one thing with the commands and the tools to do it. And I personally prefer the framework approach when it came to the apps. Um, although I really liked the look of React for you know, using it as an extra library and things like the WordPress backend. That's a great usage of it. It's a library in that case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, Divi Framework uh, website, yep. can you tell us about that, what the model is there, what you're offering? And yeah, sure. All right. DiviFramework.com. We've really enjoyed Divi. Um, we found it very, very easy for our customers to do things, but we found it had a few minor weaknesses. So what we did is fixed them and made plugins. <laughs> so we've got things like a breadcrumb module, right? We all like using um, Yoast SEO and the breadcrumbs. So we made a breadcrumb module that does that. And then we like using advanced custom fields. So we made a tool for our post types that makes it real easy to use Divi to lay out the detail page. And as we started building all this stuff, we were like, hey, people might want to use this too. Other people might actually buy it. Let's test that out and we'll make DiviFramework.com. So we've just been converting all our plugins to the point that they can be purchasable and usable. We've got all the APIs already working. All our plugins are used on about 50 different websites now and they're getting very stable. So we really just need to pull our finger out and get our documentation done, don't we? Yeah, we've got a knowledge base, layouts, pre-made layouts for things. Uh, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Different types of posts for FAQ modules. Just all sorts, yeah. Everything we kind of made for all our customers, we've just started to turn them into products. Yeah. <coughs> Great talk. Um, you said that you researched other options uh, in that one day of like researching for yes. the teachers one. Yes. Yep. Well, can you elaborate on what the other options might have been? Accelerator was one of the big ones. One of the things we wanted to make sure we were going to use is skills that we already had. 
we've got a lot of JavaScript developers. We didn't want to go and start writing Java and Objective C, right? So you, that means you have to write the app twice. So we looked at that other .NET thing as well. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, there's like a .NET library. So we were looking at things that where you write the code once and it renders out multiple times. So we looked at Accelerator, PhoneGap, Ionic. And when I was using Ionic, I found Ionic version 2 and um, I just fell in love with it. It was just easy and elegant. So that's how I came up with that solution. We've done apps for Accelerator though. If you look at my portfolio, the live video streaming I did for Vans and Billabong, they were all done in Accelerator. Titanium. Um, uh, what, sorry? No, I haven't. Yeah, okay. Now I'll have to take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, using native. Yeah, Accelerate is the same. It goes through a bridge to a native. Yeah. Yeah, same as Accelerator, actually, that. So the great thing for you guys is, think about this, when you build an app with PhoneGap, quite often everything that you're looking at is actually HTML, it's in a browser. But it's just wrapped inside the app. Some of these newer tools, what they do use is the actual native components. So instead of using a HTML button that's HTML, it's a real button that's taken out of the native environment. And as a result, you get faster apps by doing that. And some of the new JavaScript things, they go through a bridge interpreter. So you end up with the JavaScript on one side and it runs through a bridge interpreter. So think, what do we do, do use a bridge for? To join two areas. So when you throw the code through the bridge, it comes through the bridge and at the other end, all those things are mapped to native components and they turn them into native views instead. So if you want to do things, I don't know if anybody knows about the Android stuff where you can now view the Android app without installing it. Have you seen that? So you can now use Android apps without having to install them. <laughs> So you can Google something, come up and say, oh yeah, that looks cool, this is the thing on a store, you click it, and you can actually use parts of the app and just download just the parts of the app that you need natively to maybe do a checkout. And then you can use things like Android Pay and all this sort of stuff, right, because you've got the native environment there. Now these kinds of tools use the bridging to get there, and if you use bridging you can do that because you can make partials of your Android app, and that means you don't even have to install it. People can use your app without installing it. It's going to be a massive breakthrough for Android because let's face it, it takes us quite a lot to go and install an app. But if we can use it before we install it, well, that's really something. And for people with low bandwidth usages, that's really big too. So you can um, check that out. That was at Google 2016 at the next. And regarding your instant notifications, so yes. Is, um, there's a tool called Firebase from Google? No, we're not using Firebase. Firebase wasn't released when we released this. This app's already 18 months old or something. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you can use it and you can just, when you sell the post, you run a PHP API that yeah. provides, just put in the access to the yeah. digital libraries or Android devices. Yeah, I think we'll take a look at that when we come to redeveloping. But yeah, I think that's a good idea. And there's a question up the back as well. For VR? Yeah, are you doing that with normal PHP templating or is that also a, like a SBA JavaScript front end on that on the, the website? For Farm VR, we use, um, if you look at the little eye in the corner of the VR images, mm -hmm. click it, it takes you through to the component that I use. I use the Google Web VR um, HTML components and someone turned it into a short code and I built a Divi component on top of that. So that we can easily just, like you basically just drag and drop the box, click it, and um, that's available on the Divi Framework website as well, the VR tools. The other one we use is Flow Player, and we're looking at using Flow Player so we can do video playlists. Flow Player has a VR playlist, and just before we left, Vimeo released 360 videos on Vimeo. So we're now considering maybe using Vimeo instead of the flowplayer.org VR tool, because we don't have to pay for it. <laughs> Flow player, you've got to pay for it, right? Yeah. And my other question was around authentication. We're talking about OAuth 2. Um, are you using any third party or plugin based authentication around that at the moment to bridge the gap? Um, 
we made our own OAuth 1.0a, um, and then we didn't like it. So we then built our own REST one about two years ago uh, with OAuth 2. And we actually used to use that for an app that I've since discontinued called Mockup App. And it was a way to be able to take screenshots and load them into devices. So if I wanted a shot, if you know someone sat here on their laptop with my screenshot in it, you could upload the screenshot and do that. It was called, so it would mock that up for you. It was pretty cool, but it just didn't take off. And I'm not very good at marketing or advertising really, so it just didn't really work. But what we did with that is I wanted to have people pay on a WooCommerce site <laughs> so I could do, do all of that and authenticate with the app that way. And we had an OAuth uh, 2.0 integration to do that and to deliver the permissions to the app that was written in Laravel with various um, Angular stuff to create all the views using Canvas stuff. Then we threw that whole Canvas object at the server. It would render out the big, nice images for us. And it was pretty cool. For a, for a nerd, but obviously the end customers just didn't think it was worth paying for. And, uh, you know, just one of those experiments, right? That, um, yeah, so we baked our own in that case. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I've really just been waiting for the native stuff. I should probably pull my finger out and help you guys a bit, but, you know, I'm a little bit busy traveling around doing other stuff. So, all right, I guess that's it for now, Ralph. If anyone wants to ask anything else, please ask me outside. Thank you. <laughs>